Hi, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Netaji Tumuru, and today I have my colleague Michael Kunzman and Mario Ponce. And for the next half hour, what we're going to be doing is sort of taking you, giving you an overview of the solution and also taking you to the journey of how we went about building this application, right from building everything on AWS and managing <coughs> containers by ourselves to uh, where we are currently with sort of more hybrid approach of having most of it running on Cloud Foundry and bits of piece of running on AWS and the end state of where we want to be with everything sort of running on uh, Cloud Foundry. So what we will not be covering in the session today is sort of explaining the intricacies of blockchain and how it sort of works. Uh, but you know, most of you probably have heard about blockchain and you heard about blockchain being this you know, global distributed database and sort of you heard about it being the network of computers uh, that you can transact. Um, but you know, for the most people sort of think about blockchain as this global immutable distributed database that sort of keeps a record of growing transaction. And that sort of opens up a whole new paradigm of application that could be built. And one such application that we kind of built on this is called TrueRec. And I'll sort of explain more on what it is. Um, and the World Economic Forum predicted that 10% of the global GDP um, by year 2027 would be stored on blockchain. So we all use internet, we sort of, that's kind of what we you know, pretty much are on the most part. So think about if internet is information, is what is being stored on internet, blockchain is internet of value. That's where all the commerce is gonna happen, that's where a lot of transactions is, is gonna be performed. Um, so what is TrueRec? So TrueRec is this, uh, a secure digital wallet for identity, academic, and employment credentials all being built on blockchain. So why does it matter? Um, so I'm sure you know, most of the people that we are here have gone through the process of applying for a job or even hired someone. You know, how do you make sure that the details that were furnished in the self-declared profile such as resume or social profile are valid? You know, you know, it, it sort of takes an enormous amount of time and effort to verify someone's credentials, but also sort of prove anyone's credentials. And when we mean by credentials, we're sort of talking about uh, someone's identity to you know, academics or where he kind of studied to where, where he kind of worked. And it, it's, a, it's a tedious effort. And uh, you know, once a person is hired, that's when the actual bureaucracy starts because companies want to be compliant, at least in US. So they kind of work with third party agencies to do this whole verification, and that takes forever, and in some cases, putting a lot of pressure on the people that were involved in the process. So why does it take so long for, to verify anyone's credentials? So this is kind of very high level view about current process on how the hiring works. Uh, I just want to focus on the three main actors, which is the job applicant, uh, the company, and the third party agency. So once the person is hired, uh, companies tend to use you know, third party agencies to actually do the verification. And it's not that they have all the details, so they need to go and work with, you know, whole sorts of institutions like universities, the governments, and, you know, former employers. And oftentimes, this is pretty manual and tedious process, and it, it, that kind of adds up to all the delays um, that's, that's being caused. So how about, like, wouldn't it be cool if we empower individuals to carry all his credentials in one wallet where he'll be able to independently prove the validity of those without having to you know, reach out to all these institutions, like proving my driver's, carrying my digital um, driver's license to carrying all my employment records and education records or micro certificates in one central place that I can prove uh, you know, without having to my, anyone, my employers calling my past institutions. Wouldn't it be cool if you know, the recruiter sort of you know, gets this resume and then can verify instantaneously um, if all the details that are furnished in the resume are actually valid or not. Um, can, the re can the records in the resume be you know, verified instantaneously? Can they be notarized? And can they be verified uh, with, a, with a bulletproof confidence that they were not actually you know, modified? And that's kind of what all um, TrueDeck is supposed to provide and that's kind of what we, we kind of aiming this application would do. And this is all built with uh, blockchain machine learning and built on top of Cloud Foundry. Um, so let's quickly go through a solution and how it sort of looks. Um, so essentially, TrueRec is this um, decentralized credential issuing and verification network that guarantees authenticity and significantly simplifies the process of issuing and verifying credentials. So let me walk through the process on how it works. 
So every institution that's part of the network would be able to issue credentials, and it could be anything from uh, the diplomas to you know the digital identities to your know, employment records, or it could be like even micro certificates and peer-to-peer -peer records. So all of this could be issued on on the on the network, and all of this would be issued directly to the to the individual. So this is not stored in a central database where that's how the traditional applicants are built built. So everything will be owned by the candidate, and the beauty of this is only the fingerprints or the hash values of those certificates would be stored on blockchain. So, and why? Because you can, we, we just spoke because blockchain is this global database and we don't want to expose that to everyone in the world to see all my information. Uh, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we, we can go back and prove those records existed at a point in time and validate if those are not actually tampered. And that's why we only store a fingerprint of those on, on the blockchain. So similarly, you know, any credentials could be issued and all of this would be stored in, in the individual's digital wallet and all the, all the fingerprints would be stored on the, on the blockchain. At any point when, when the candidate wants to prove his credentials to any institutions, he can select the details that were relevant in that context and, and, then, and then pass it on to a potential verifier. So the verifier gets a link with, that the candidate has shared and, and once he opens the link, the, the recomputation of hashes happen, and then they get compared against blockchain. So that way we can make sure that those credentials that were issued were not tampered. We know who it was issued from and whom it was issued to, and we also know that at what point it was issued. And because there's no one, uh, because blockchain is immutable, uh, no one or no central institution controls it, there's no way that someone could modify it. So that kind of provides, so, so in, in essence, we're using blockchain as, as, as an anchor proof to make sure nothing is actually modified here. Um, so quickly walking through how the solution could potentially look. Um, so on the left side, you imagine we have this hypothetical situation where we have uh, a university that's issuing credentials. So student could log into the student portal um, request for his credential to be issued. The document would be sent to the candidate. The fingerprints would be registered to the blockchain. Uh, student would uh, open his uh, mobile wallet, uh, and then he goes through this whole um, identity validation, and we apply uh, computer vision and machine learning techniques to make sure the person is who he is claiming to be. And once he kind of establishes his identity, um, he gets into the app, he imports the file that, we, uh, that was issued by the, by the institution, and that's the central place. So he wants all the records in one central place, and that sort of becomes his repository of all his credentials from his identity to employment records to education. And at any point he wants to prove those details, he can then select the details that he wants to send to a potential verifier and, and then pass it on, uh, and the verifier would get a link. Uh, that's what you see on, on the right side there. And once, he, once the verifier opens it up, then the recomputation of hashes happen, and. Uh, and then the validity to make sure that those credentials are valid or not would happen behind the scenes. So quickly wrapping up, um, just kind of how the data flow happens. So I mentioned we have three main actors in this process, which is one is the issuing institution, the student itself, and the potential verifier. When the, when the records are being issued, um, the actual data, which is the off-chain data, which is the actual credentials, the clear text document, is sent to the candidate itself in a special file called true file. And the fingerprints of those documents, which is the on-chain data, which actually gets stored on blockchain, is written to the blockchain using Ethereum Gateway, which is the component that we, um, sort of the, the wrapper that we built on top of Ethereum. And, and all this data would be stored on the mobile wallet. And when the candidate actually sends it, uh, he generates a link, which kind of creates a temporary storage for the data that's stored on the mobile phone. Uh, and the link gets sent to a verifier. And when the verifier opens the link, the recomputation of hashes happen, and then they go back and check against um, the blockchain to make sure none of things have been changed. So this is kind of the high level flow on how it works. Uh, I'll now pass it on to my colleagues. Um, they'll kind of dive a little bit more deeper into the technical architecture um, and sort of talking to the journey on where we started and sort of where we are right now and kind of explain more details how the application works. All right, uh, hello. Uh, how many of you are developers here? Awesome. So uh, my name is Mario and my colleague uh, Mitch here. Uh, we're gonna uh, deep dive a little bit on the uh, architecture and the components that we 
actually used to build this platform. Uh, so um, I will start um, describing the journey. So when we uh, actually started developing this application, uh, we were exploring how uh, the blockchain works and uh, how to, uh, we will actually offer the service and um, how we'll integrate the pieces. So we are starting with a lot of uh, Docker containers uh, and putting uh, some pieces in, in each container. And um, at some point when uh, we were developing, we realized that we were investing a lot of time uh, actually containerizing each, each application and the most of those components uh, were actually uh, like uh, Node.js applications or Python, uh, Ruby on Rails, uh, and, um, and, and we needed some, some basic support for databases like MongoDB to store metadata. And uh, we, we said, okay, maybe we need just a platform where we just push the applications instead of uh, investing time in um, creating those containers. And we will um, use containers only for the parts that uh, are strictly needed. Uh, so um, from, from the slide here, uh, you have on the left side the Turtle Client. Uh, that is a small uh, Node.js uh, piece of software that the, um, that the issuer has uh, the private key. Then uh, let's say that this is a university, so university will have the private key. They will uh, encrypt the uh, certificates, and then they will uh, submit that through our platform, and then we will uh, pass it on to the uh, Ethereum uh, blockchain. So um, I want to mention that we are only like a proxy application. Uh, we are not storing the documents at any point, uh, so we are just passing it on to, to the blockchain. And then um, in return, we uh, send uh, the uh, candidate, uh, in this case the, the um, beneficiary of this certificate, a small file that he will share with uh, any potential uh, verifier. Okay, so uh, then uh, as I said, from the containers we decided that we needed a, a platform and that's where Cloud Foundry uh, was a natural choice for us. Uh, and, and we um, started pushing applications inside uh, Cloud Foundry. So here, um, again, uh, we have the uh, true Red Client component on the left, and um, the first trip for the transaction is that we are receiving it and sending it to an issuer API that runs on Node.js, that's an application inside Cloud Foundry. And uh, this actually gave us uh, the opportunity to scale up because we introduce uh, components like uh, RabbitMQ there. So we have like worker queues and um, able to distribute the workload. And uh, we left the Ethereum Go client on the AWS because that was the part that uh, we still needed a container for that part. Um, so and our next step is actually we're going to move that to Cloud Foundry. But for now, is that still uh, running on AWS. And then um, the second part where the candidate wants to share that with um, with the verifier, uh, then we also have an API there and uh, we match with some metadata that we previously store on MongoDB and um, that is sent to the, uh, to the verifier. So, um, so what this uh, gave us is, uh, as developer, the flexibility of just taking our apps and pushing to the platform. So uh, that uh, gives us more time to focus on development and um, not uh, working too much on containers. And um, my colleague Mish here will uh, deep dive on uh, other pieces of the uh, architecture. Thank you, Mario. All right, so I will dive a little bit more into detail and also like why we made certain design decisions. Um, so traditionally, if you develop a blockchain application, especially like a distributed application on top of Ethereum, like the typical approach is that you would typically run your own blockchain node on your local device basically and um, hook a web application up to the RPC API that that um, blockchain node, the Ethereum uh, node would expose. Um, however, like you run into the same old on-premise problems again because you need to operate that actually. So that means like the issuer would need to operate uh, this, um, this blockchain node. And especially in our uh, project, we experienced that there's like uh, a lot more like complexity of running a blockchain node than just running like or like uh, running a let's say um, a web server. Um, 
Uh, one big problem was storage, uh, because basically whenever you join a blockchain network, usually you need to download the whole blockchain. And I don't know how it is currently with Bitcoin, for instance, like there's, I think, 70 or 80 gigabytes of the blockchain. So basically, if you want to participate in the blockchain network, you need to first uh, plan for two, two days to like sync up with the whole network to download the whole distributed history of transactions. Um, and uh, so we are uh, so we're currently doing that project with one of our online learning platforms, OpenSAP, um, to deliver the first solution in a small circle of users. And basically, for them, they said, like, yeah, it's like for us, like, it's uh, too much of an operational burden. Um, and also, what we have experienced is like whatever, uh, what actually also happens for some time that sometimes, if let's say there's a data corruption in our local uh, in our local node, uh, then we had to kind of recover from that. And that would typically mean, okay, we, we, we need to resync on the whole blockchain again. So basically, um, our task was basically to kind of provide like a, like to take a lot of operational burden from like issuers, like credential issuers, and kind of um, take the storage part out basically. Um, and still, but still maintaining the, um, the attributes of the blockchain being a distributed, uh, distributed um, a network where um, different institutions, organizations have an identity established and can issue and sign transactions with their private key. So that's why we built kind of our own little light blockchain node, uh, which is called the True Client. And all it does and all it can do is nothing else than just signing transactions. Um, and basically what we do, all these signed transactions, it's basically um, basically just a um, just a hex uh, string that we just uh, push into our platform and we just use our central blockchain node to broadcast this signed transaction out into the network. So therefore still, um, uh, the transaction cannot still be tampered because it's signed by the uh, by the issuer, um, and still like um, the whole storage problem is solved because we uh, we uh, kind of manage the whole operations for the for the blockchain. We have redundancy basically in our platform. Um, yeah. So um, another thing, interesting thing that uh, we had to solve is like the whole uh, deployment um, aspect. So traditionally, like if you deploy like if you, if you follow like all these hello world examples and you, you do nothing else than a CF, CF push basically on your command line and the application runs. However, whenever you uh, deploy an application, you have a, s a short downtime. So especially for those um, issuer APIs, so the uh, RESTful APIs that we expose to the uh, to the issuer client, they need to be highly available. So whenever we need we need to fix a bug or something, that API needs to be highly available. So for that, we introduced a zero downtime zero downtime deployment, and for that we are using blue-green deployment. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with uh, blue-green deployment. Basically the idea is that for every app on Cloud Foundry you have a um, instance that you one tag blue and another you tag it uh, green and basically all you do like on an update you switch between them, you switch the routes between those applications. So that's what we are using um, in our deployment. So for that, uh, because um, the Cloud Foundry client uh, does not support that out of the box, so we have to write our own shell scripts for that, um, that we're just uh, executing with our on-premise uh, Travis CI. Um, exactly. So um, another interesting thing is also um, that we rely heavily on um, uh, RabbitMQ. So especially like when we, so we have, you see like a lot of different services. You see the issuer API, you see the sharing API. We have uh, an email microservice, and basically we use RabbitMQ to um, hook everything. Like everything is happening platform. We basically do that heavily message based. So that means like whenever we broadcast a transaction into the platform. Um, um, as you can see here, um, we kind of put it into a queue basically and have um, kind of a transaction monitor picking up that transaction, podcasting it into the platform and monitoring that transaction. So that means like if something goes wrong with a transaction, we can notify back and say, hey, there's something wrong with a transaction, please check on that. Um, or once a transaction has been confirmed, which actually can take up to one minute for the transaction to be, con to be confirmed, uh, the monitor will um, watch for that and will then um, uh, broadcast back to the Red Room queue, hey, we need to send uh, the document uh, to, the to, the, to the actual credential owner and we use basically, in this case, Amazon SES for that. Um, also another thing, another issue that we had, um, especially um, 
uh, with, with Cloud Foundry was um, uh, Cloud Foundry out of the box doesn't support something like API rate limits and stuff. So for that, we still had to use um, AWS API gateway. And also for CDN, we still had to use um, um, uh, Amazon Cloud Fund. So this is currently where we're at right now, but there's also a lot of things that we plan to do. I mean, Trek, it's still like very, so it's a pilot project. We're still learning a lot of things. We're um, um, we have a lot of plans on what we want to change. So still, it's not really nice that uh, the whole Ethereum stuff has to run. So currently, we run it on Amazon ECS, uh, Amazon Container Services. Um, and there's like a lot of gap between because like we need to make sure that everything's secure, like the whole communication between Cloud Foundry, SAP Cloud Platform, and, and Amazon Container. Um, Amazon Container Services, uh, so we had um, to introduce like a lot of security mechanisms in between. Um, uh, so our idea is like, um, like in the end, everything should kind of run in Cloud Foundry. Um, so currently, you can still run like binaries in uh, con like in, and containerize them in Cloud Foundry apps, but still there's like lots of storage issu issues because uh, blockchain nodes take a lot of like uh, file system storage, and um, so that's why we kind of just used um, ECS for that. But uh, we are planning on transitioning uh, that into um, um, into Cloud Foundry and use SAP's services for that. And also what we also plan to use in the future is um, SAP API Gateway um, for that. Um, yes. Um, all right, so do you have any questions so far? Okay, there's one question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically, um, basically what would happen, like, so initially if you start using, if you start using the system, uh, you would typically uh, download uh, this uh, Node.js client, actually, so it's, um, it's uh, actually a, a small web service that people can integrate into their platform. So in our case, OpenSAP, um, they uh, use this uh, client, they integrate that into their existing Ruby and Rails platform, and with that client has capabilities to generate that key, basically. Um, and f for that, they would establish uh, the identity on the Ethereum network. Um, so whenever basically a user basically on the platform clicks, hey, I want uh, this certificate of this course that I completed, I want this to be on blockchain, they click on a button, and um, in the background, um, the, the microservice would collect the document, would hash it, would bring it, would uh, can, um, create like our, so we have to find our JSON structure for that, which actually follows an open, um, open standard. We actually use um, uh, Mozilla Open Badges for that. Um, and basically, uh, that data gets basically hashed. Um, it gets written into a uh, transaction, and um, this transaction, action will actually become signed by the issuer, uh, by their private key. And uh, from there, it is always, can always be associated and verified, okay, this transaction has been signed by this uh, person and we broadcast it into um, the blockchain network. And the blockchain network will do a lot of checks, it will confirm, there's a lot of like uh, blockchain specific stuff that need to be confirmed, like gas price and like, okay, do you actually provide like a high enough transaction fee and stuff like that. It will also uh, validate the signature and stuff like that. And eventually this, um, uh, this transaction will be, um, up, but this goes a little bit more into blockchain. So I think for that, I, for people who are not like familiar how like the whole trust system with blockchain itself works, I would recommend looking further into that. But basically, uh, the transaction at some point by the network gets um, written into a block, uh, which then at some point gets confirmed by all those nodes. So basically, all those nodes in the network they use a so-called consensus mechanism to agree. On okay, like okay, so this is actually what we're gonna write now. So, and basically, once it is written there, it will stay there forever. Um, however, um, for with Ethereum, we're using so-called smart contract functionality. Um, so that means um, we also actually don't just allow issuers to write things to the blockchain because if we just write things to the blockchain, then why don't we just use like something like PDF, signed PDFs or something like that? So actually the whole strength of blockchain is uh, that you have a history of transactions. So what we imagine in the future is, and actually what we currently implemented is that you can also revoke a transaction. And the smart contract, which is kind of like a 
object containing the whole, all the certificates basically um, on the blockchain will verify that only, or make sure that um, only the issuer can actually revoke a transaction later on. Yeah, um, and in the future, we also plan stuff like, okay, like uh, expiring certificates and certificates that can be renewed and stuff like that. And all that stuff is currently like hard to handle if you want to do it like in a central or a traditional way. Yeah. Uh, what's the availability of this application to SAP's customers? And mm -hmm. uh, is this more like a set of libraries or is this actually more like a as a service? It's a service, yeah. So, um, uh, so currently it's available like part of uh, the, uh, um, I think it's the Imagine IoT course on OpenSAP. So actually it's not available yet, it will be available soon. Uh, we are still working very hard on getting this out. Um, basically it's a service um, that we provide uh, to SAP customers, uh, basically, or actually any people who participate in that course. Um, and then for like issuers, um, we provide kind of a library. It's actually the NPM, NPM module that you can install globally. It's a, and you can just start it with from the command line and just run it in your platform. So it's, it's more like a demo app uh, related to an online course. Um, yeah, exactly. It's a pilot application. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's still kind of in pilot and labs environment. Mm -hmm. So we're um, still yes. doing some testing. As we said, we're still in the pilot phase, so we're going to look at the scalability mm -hmm. aspects and high availability. I mean, it, the blockchain mm -hmm. itself is very much, though it's yeah. very promising, it's still very nascent. So we want to make sure it's stable. Anything that mm -hmm. comes out of SAP has to be highly reliable. So we're going to make sure of that and then probably mm -hmm. look into the commercialization aspects. What's mm -hmm. the name of the course this is part of? Touch IoT. What? Touch IoT. Touch IoT, not imagine. Yeah, it's it's an mm -hmm. open SAP MOOC course. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, there's also there's a lot of commercial or possible commercial commercialization aspects that we have looked into. Um, but currently, we just want to uh, focus on this small thing, making the platform stable, and then from there see, okay, like how can we scale from there? So there was also a question over there. That's a very good question. And that's a, that's a problem that we are currently facing at the moment. So right now, what we do, um, we have a limited set of issues. So basically, currently, we pay them. So we provide them with the ether or with the cryptocurrency to be able to issue those transactions. So um, there's a lot of things that need to be figured out still. Uh, but part in this pilot, I think this is like a currently a viable way for us to do it. I mean, we're still looking into the business model aspect mm -hmm. of it. Uh, but technically, when we kind of evaluated this project, mm -hmm. um, in US alone, there's like 60 million checks that happen every year. And it, on average, it costs for like 30, 40 bucks per check. Um, so there's, there's definitely a lot of money in it. But how do we commercialize? Who pays for it? It's still something in work in progress. Uh, we want to make sure the platform itself can scale and then sort of put the hooks into monetization aspects. Yeah. Uh, just to clarify, you are intending to run this against the public Ethereum? Yes, correct. Yeah, uh, there's also like a lot of like, um, I mean, there's also like private blockchains and stuff, but we really see like for this project, this has to be on a public blockchain uh, because the more nodes on the network participate, participate, the more trustworthy and stable the network is. Um, so that's, so we evaluate a lot of options. There's like, there was a Bitcoin, we have a, we have a Bitcoin, Ethereum, things like multi-chain and stuff. And like the only things where we, see like what is really like truly blockchain in our opinion is something like Bitcoin or Ethereum where it's like really a publicly uh, and transparent network basically where a lot of different use cases are implemented and a lot of different people have interest in the platform to be running. So that's why we uh, for, uh, at the moment uh, co have committed to Ethereum and for as, um, as of right now we had um, we have made really good experience because Ethereum itself also um, exposes like really sophisticated APIs, especially like with the whole uh, smart contract functionality. So this is very, very benef beneficial for us. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, with Hyperledger, um, basically the idea is that you would uh, create your own um, 
like blockchain network. So that would happen typically like if you run a business network of like for for instance like we have a supply chain and stuff like that. Um, and and there like the typical use case would be like you want to create your own network. And also Hyperledger solves a lot of more more problems. For instance, like encryption of the actual data, so the data is actually not visible to to um, to all the nodes. We are so we are also kind of related to the team um, who uh, works with Hyperledger. Um, uh, for now, we have invalidated uh, Ethereum, um, and we have made we have uh, made a really good experience with e Ethereum so far. Um, and kind of the reason why not Hyperledger is um, there is no like like the one Hyperledger network, right? So, and also especially like if you if we want to develop like a product at this point with like a uh, higher trustworthiness, I think that's why we decided to um, go for a public. One instance that worked basically. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, so only in the uh, um, so only at two stages. The first stage would be during the issuing process because like. Um, the transaction needs some time to be confirmed on the blockchain, and for that uh, we cache the certificate in the MongoDB, and after we send out the email, we delete it from the from the database, basically. Then in the second stage, when the user actually decides by himself to share the certificate, like and store it on our platform, and hence generate a link, um, so this would be the second time. What we also what we're implementing right now is kind of a self destruction mechanism. So basically the a certificate, or the, or basically the user can say, okay, I only want this link avail to be available for let's say 48 hours, and then after that the certificate is gone. So our aim is truly like that, like the user uh, kind of owns their data basically. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. I think we're sort of running out of time here. Uh, we're more than happy to take any questions uh, offline. Yeah. We are hiring, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>